Good evening. My name is Jim Moran, and I'm the director of outreach here at the Antiquarian Society. And I want to welcome you all to this program on uh, discovering the great divorce by Elaine Wu. But before I turn our attention to this evening's program, I just want to say a few words about this: uh, the Wu card. Now, this unfortunately is not named for our guest speaker. <laughs> Wu stands for Worcester, or rather, Worcester. And uh, if you have a Wu card, uh, please let us swipe it, and you'll earn two Wu points for coming to this lecture. In fact, all our public lectures are worth two points, and uh, our public tours, which are held every Wednesday at 3 o'clock and are free, are also worth three Wu points. So. Uh, please come to all of these and bring your Wu card. And if you don't have a Wu card, well, you must get one. Uh, the Wu cards are the brainchild of the Worcester Cultural Coalition, and Wu cards are a great value and enhance your experience with the vibrant cultural or offerings of our region. With a Wu card, you receive discounts and special offers for cool concerts, dynamic theater, unique museums, magical music, street festivals, outdoor adventures, and more throughout Worcester County throughout the year. Please see your Read More About It sheet for more information about the Wu card and how to get one. Remember, while you can listen to Wu tonight, you can't get the full benefit of that Wu without this one. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by Fruitlands Museum. Fruitlands is a museum complex located in Harvard, Massachusetts, where you can explore heritage, nature, and art. The museum is on the site of the famed utopian community founded by Franz Walcott in the 1840s. The museum also features exhibits on American art, Native Americans, and the Shakers. And it is all located on a breathtakingly beautiful hillside. I urge you to visit the museum. It's a fascinating and gorgeous experience. Our guest speaker this evening, Dillian Wu, holds a BA from Yale College and a PhD in English from Columbia University. She first came to the Society in 2004 to study in our library as a Kate B. and Hall J. Peterson Fellow. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, let me just say the American Antiquarian Society is a national research library and learned society of pre 20th century American history and culture. Beyond that door there are 25 miles of shelves that house the printed record of the United States from the years 1640 to 1876. Some of our collections, including our pre-1820 imprints, are the most extensive in the world. We also host a wide variety of programs to foster discussion and study about our nation's past, including offering about 35 fellowships to academic scholars, as well as creative artists and writers. As I said, Ilian first came to us in 2004 and had the opportunity, as she described in her fellowship report, to make new friends while reading old texts. As is often the case with our fellows, her time here was transformative. She found great material in our archives, including the only known copies of the newspaper, the Albany Gazette, and Daily Advertiser, which helped her bring Eunice Chapman's legal struggles to life. She was also able to do a great deal of investigative work on Eunice's life in Albany through local directories, county histories, and legislative journals. But more than the work in the library, Billion's time spent discussing her project with the AAS staff and the other fellows in residence also changed the way she conceived the story and the way she would ultimately tell it. Such conversations are often a hallmark of researchers' work here at AS. While we are a library, our mantra is not shh, but rather, what are you working on and how can we help you? We have come to understand that the more fellows and researchers talk about their projects, the more they develop them. The combination of reading, talking and listening can change a project in wonderful and unexpected ways. 
So please join me in listening to Eileen Wu talk about her project, The Great Divorce. Well, first of all, I think everybody should go out and get a Wu card and, uh, <laughs> and get double Wu points for listening to Wu tonight. So I have, I'm just so excited to be here, and I have so many thanks to express, I don't even know where to begin. In fact, I think the theme of the evening is going to be thank you. Um, I'll start first by thanking Jim Moran and, um, for putting together this program, as well as Maggie Green, who hosted a really fun, dramatic reading event at uh, the Fruitlands Museum on Friday. But where next? I was thinking very hard about this, and I don't think I can think of a single area a single aspect of my journey with this book that doesn't owe something significant to the American Antiquarian Society. My go-to source for everything 19th century and more. What did Eunice Chapman's tell-all narratives actually look like? Were they pamphlets, as the Shakers said, or were they books, as Eunice herself boasted? What were they made of? Who made them? And how were they assembled? I had no idea when I started out. But Tom Knowles and David Whitesell helped me find the answers. I learned, for example, that printers had to press so hard to, um, to, to press the, the pages with the image that they actually um, grew lopsided. Um, one, one side of their body was like musk, and the muscles were bigger than the other. So who was in power when Eunice Chapman took her case to Albany in 1815? What was the political makeup of the legislature? And how did it change from then until 1818, when she finally made history? Who else to ask but Philip Lamby? What was in fashion during the second decade of the 19th century? How did Shaker clothing, the sisters' baggy gowns, the brothers' short pants and wide-brimmed hats measure up to the latest styles? I had no idea. But Lynn Bassett, who was a fellow when I was here and who is now an elected member, certainly did. What was it like to travel at the time? What did people ride? How did they navigate the mud and the snow without four-wheel drive? What might it have been like for a single woman like Eunice to travel alone? Carolyn Sloat pointed me in the right direction. These are just some of the questions that I had coming into this project for which the AAS community helped me find the answers. But I'll go even farther than that, and I think it's safe to say that without the American Antiquarian Society, I would not have a book, at least not this one. I came to the AAS as a Peterson Fellow in 2004, knowing I wanted to do something with Eunice Chapman's story. What, I wasn't quite sure. I was fresh from a PhD program at Columbia University, where I'd written my dissertation on anti -shaker, narratives written by anti-shakers and shaker apostates, including Eunice Chapman. The natural choice for me at this point would have been to write a monograph on Eunice Chapman and her anti-shaker work, or perhaps on Eunice and Mother Lucy Wright, who was the head of the Shakers at the time, and who Eunice went up against in her fight against the Shaker world. Actually, this is what, where I thought I was going with the proposal, and the original, um, the original title for my project was Mother Against Mother. But I secretly yearned to do something different. This was a story, after all, about a mother's epic fight to recapture her missing children, with not one, but three kidnappings, a thrilling legal battle, hot talk about sex, and a climactic mob attack, not to mention an incredibly photogenic and beloved use of the insect. I wanted to find a way to bring the drama and the period alive, and to a wider audience, perhaps even to the big screen. I remember sitting around this glossy wooden table where the fellows present their work, and hearing from the other fellows like Lynn, and Carolyn Sloat, and John Hinch, and others, and this was the way to go. And it wasn't just support that they gave me, although that itself was tremendous. It was next steps. One of the fellows here, Cindy Lobel, uh, put me in touch with a literary agent who took up the project on the basis of an idea and eventually sold the book to Grove Atlantic and actually my um, uh, publicist's mother is sitting here also. <laughs> so I could go on and on, but I'll stop now as if you met and you have probably got a sense of the immense debt I owe to everyone. Besides, I haven't even gotten mentioned the primary sources that first brought me here, and truly, without these sources, I would not have a story to tell. It is a tragedy that the New York legislature lost all of its early records, which of course included everything in Eunice Chapman's case in a devastating fire. 
every single scrap of information that would have brought life to the legal drama, personal depositions, records from committee hearings, interviews with the Shaker elders, burned into a crisp. I just imagine that parched yellow paper going up in flames and it just uh, gives me a big shudder every time. All that remained then are the published journals, and these are not sexy from a researcher's point of view. The Committee for the Relief of Eunice Chapman presented its report. The Assembly discussed the engrossed bill on the relief for Eunice Chapman. Blah, blah, blah. Yes, but what did they discuss? What, why did they vote yay and nay? What were people saying about Eunice? This is what we want to know. And we know nothing if it weren't for a single precious source that owes its life to the American Antiquarian Society. The AAS has the only remaining copies, at least that anyone knows of, of the Albany Gazette and Daily Advertiser, the newspaper that brought news of Eunice Chapman's story to the world. This newspaper records the debates on Eunice's case in breathless and scandalous detail. I remember rearing to go every morning while I was here, and Vincent Golden would come and bring these enormous books of papers. I mean, newspapers were like this big, um, you know, not like this. Spread it out before me, and it was just like a feast, reading it about all the twists and turns in the case. I could hardly tear myself away, although I was forced to for a time. You see, when I first came to the AAS, I was newly pregnant, not just with a book, but with a child. So the, for me, the process of writing about a mother and become a mother, becoming a mother have, be, um, have gone hand in hand from the start. When I showed up here, actually, I remember not feeling very well and um, miserably munching on some saltines and looking out at Carolyn Sloat, um, where is she here, um, looking into her kind, thoughtful eyes and um, telling her I could go home for a while. When I came back, I had a belly like this. I could barely sit from the table. And everybody laughed, and she said, we thought that might have been the reason. <laughs> but I think there's something they didn't know, so I should make a confession right here, which is, I wanted to stay, and the reason why I left is I remember sitting over there in that other room, and just being so queasy, and having these great newspapers in front of me, and thinking, I'm just going to destroy this. <laughs> Fortunately, I got to come back, and then I read to my heart's content. I will never forget the feeling, the beating of my heart as I poured over that gigantic paper, my baby boy kicking away inside of me while the case came alive before my eyes. And what a case it was. Eunice Chapman's fight for her missing children enthralled all of Albany and beyond and consumed the New York legislature for more than three years. All of which is amazing when you think about how it all began. It began quite simply with a bad marriage. Eunice Holly and Jamie Chapman met in Durham, New York, where James is a businessman, and Eunice's family had moved from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Neither was in top form. James was much older than Eunice, a widower in his um, early 40s, and he had a daughter from his first marriage, whom he had been left to raise alone. <coughs> Eunice, meanwhile, was having some trouble on the marriage market, probably because of her family's financial problems, not to mention her advanced age. She was 26, which in this era was past marital prime. Nevertheless, each had something that the other wanted. Eunice had James all worked up to quote him into the same delirious state as the young man spoken of by Solomon where he says the way to her house was the way to hell. Lust was his motivating factor. Eunice did not share his sentiments. James, to her eyes, was disagreeable and old. However, he offered her a security that she could not refuse. And so the, the two agreed to marry on one cold, sad day in February of 1804. Everything seemed fine in the beginning. Eunice had her first child, George, almost exactly a year after they married, and two girls, Susan and Julia, not long after that. Business was good. But there was one serious problem, which is that soon after they got married, Eunice and James realized that they hated each other's guts. <laughs> James claimed that Eunice drove him into the ground with her nagging and bickering. But Eunice had also reason to complain. James
James was a drunkard and he was abusive. Before long, their lives fell into shambles with James so intoxicated that he couldn't even sit up in a wagon. He could not run his own business and he ran into debt. Finally, in 1811, James moved out. According to him, it was by mutual agreement. According to her, it was abandonment. Alone in Durham, Eunice struggled to support her three children by herself, the youngest of whom was just a toddler. Meanwhile, James went off to New York City to drown his sorrows and eventually moved near Albany to start a business with his brother. And who knows what course his life might have taken if he hadn't faithfully encountered an unusual community of people called the Shakers. Now you might think that the Shakers would have been appealing to a woman like Eunice, brought to America in 1774 by a charismatic English visionary named Anne Lee, this was a society that promised both material and spiritual security, not to mention extraordinary opportunities for women. The Shakers were a radical, egalitarian, religious community that believed that salvation was readily available to all, that heaven was available here and now. The ticket for admission, however, had a high price. Access to paradise was contingent upon giving up all worldly bonds in favor of a perfectly Christ-like life. And this meant renouncing the exclusive ties of family, property, and most famously, sexuality. The sexual renunciation actually began with Anne Lee, or Mother Anne as she was known, a woman for whom biological motherhood was synonymous with misery. In Manchester, England, Lee had seen her own mother suffer through childbirth after childbirth. And actually got so bad that she begged her, she begged her father to her mother to stop having sex with her father, and her father started coming after her with a whip. She then went on herself to go through several excruciating deliveries, four by most counts, eight by others, and none of the children survived infancy. Then, while reeling from grief and searching for spiritual answers, she had this vision of Adam and Eve fornicating in the Garden of Eden. In this moment, she realized that the source of her own suffering was also the reason for humanity's fall. Celibacy then, in her eyes, became the first necessary step for redemption. Mother Anne went on to build a religion that was a godsend with thousands beyond herself, many of them women. The Shaker celibate communitarian lifestyle freed women from the endless cycles of drudgery and childbirth that were the norm for most. This is not to say that the Shaker sisters didn't work hard, they often worked themselves to the bone. But they no longer had to worry about where their next meal was coming from, how to clothe, feed, or manage their families. The Shaker women labored together, and what's more, they could follow their spiritual calling and become leaders, ranking equal to or even above the men. Now, many women, like Eunice Chapman, jumped to join into this community. But Eunice was a different story. Eunice may have been a strong religious woman who was struggling to make ends meet, all of which voted very well for the Shakers. But she was also stubborn, fiercely independent, and inclined to oppose her husband. When James Chapman returned home in the fall of 1812, eager to bring his entire family into the Shaker world, Eunice adamantly refused to go along or to let the children go without her. She did not want to move anywhere. She didn't want anyone else to provide for her and her family. This, she insisted, was her husband's role. Now her refusal put James in a bind. As he saw it, he was turning his life around, trying to do right by his family, and here Eunice stood once again in the way. He might have left, except that he couldn't, because the Shaker said he could not join their world until he settled his worldly debts. This is why, on one fine October day, he took covert action. He waited for a moment when he was sure that Eunice was out of her home, came back, threw his children in a wagon, and whisked them off to the Waterfleet Shakers near Albany. When Eunice came after them and started making trouble, he took off with the children yet again. This time, however, he fled the state secretly bringing the children into a Shaker community in Enfield, New Hampshire. And there he kept the children hidden from their mother for more than three long years. Now, Eunice Chapman was in no position to fight back. She had no money, no resources, and no rights. A married woman like herself was considered civilly dead in 
the eyes of the law. She could not earn property, earn wages, sign contracts, or testify against her husband whose legal identity covered over her own. She also had no control over her children. By a law, the Chapman children belonged to their father. In all probability, the story should have ended right there with the children's disappearance, and Eunice herself should have vanished into history. But her story survives for two reasons. First, because this remarkable woman wagered everything in her fight for her children. Defying all expectation that she should suffer quietly through her troubles, Eunice Chapman took on not only her husband, but the shakers and the very law and culture of her times in an extraordinary way for her missing children. At a time when women were not welcome in the public arena, she took her case to the legislature at the highest levels of state government. And at a time when literary tell-alls were far from the norm, she penned thrilling tell-alls in support of her cause, essentially narratives of shaker captivity. And finally, at a time when the law was simply not enough, she eschewed legal jurisdiction for vigilante justice, even rousing a mom. But beyond Eunice's own actions, there's a second reason why Eunice's story can be told today, and that is that a young man named William Lee Stone took notice. So introducing William Lee Stone. Stone was the youthful editor of the Albany Gazette and Daily Advertiser, not 25 years old when Eunice's case got off the ground. Boyish in appearance, with a plump, handsome face and a full head of feathery brown hair, he was by Thurlow Weed's description, quote, a half-grown and half-learned itinerant printer without friends or money, unquote. You may perhaps recognize Stone's name from his connection to another sensational affair involving a young woman's fight against a secret of religious society. In the 1830s, Stone published an expose called Maria Monk <coughs> and the nunnery of the Hotel Dieu, in which he challenged Monk's claims that she had been held captive and abused in a Catholic convent. <clears throat> Monk's allegations against the Catholic Church were incredibly salacious, including charge of, charges of rape and infanticide, and Stone's work, as his son wrote, put an effectual quietus upon that extraordinary mania into which divines and laymen were led by the fictions of a silly, profligate woman. Does not bode well for you. In Albany, Stone was given an unprecedented journalistic honor, his own special seat in the legislature. But he had his weaknesses in this role. To begin with, he was hardly an impartial observer. He was feisty and even combative, and as, as a result, he faced a number of libel suits in future years, two from his one-time friend, the writer James Fenimore Cooper. Stone's own father, a minister and Yale graduate, who had given Stone all the education he had, and once er, um, warned, you write my son with a pen dipped in vinegar. <coughs> Politically speaking, Stone was conservative. He favored old school Federalists, who believed it prudent to centralize authority in the hands of a few, judicious, wise few, and he poo-pooed Republicans in all their talks about the rights of the common man. And despite his special standing in the legislature, he had his enemies. Among them, the Republican Assemblyman Erastus Root. Known as a Brigadier General, Root was popularly loved for his colorful wit, which he would use actively in Eunice's case, but Stone, for one, considered him a demagogue and came to despise him all the more because of Eunice. Yet, for all his faults and his eventual opposition to Eunice Chapman's cause, Stone played an indispensable role in communicating her story, above all, her legislative trials. Now, before discussing his contributions, I should probably say a, wor um, a word about a question that people frequently bristled in with in Eunice Chapman's own time, which is why she pursued her case in the legislature in the first place. And the brief answer to that is that, legally speaking, she basically didn't have a choice. Not if she wanted rights to custody and divorce, not in New York. When it came to custody, paternal prerogative was so much presumed there was actually nothing in New York state law that indicated how a mother might take back her children from her husband. In fact, if, you, if a husband could will his child to anyone, or children to anyone, even to his lover after he died, and there's nothing that his wife could do about it. Um, as for a divorce, Eunice might have been fine if she lived just about anywhere else, where abandonment, for instance, was considered just grounds for ending a marriage. But New York law was exceptionally conservative when it came to divorce law, and it would remain so until 
last month when government, Governor Patterson finally signed no-fault or unilateral no-fault divorce into law. In Eunice's era, the laws were even more stringent. From then until 1966, 1966, adultery was the sole criteria for ending a marriage. Now what this meant in 1815, before annulment was a possibility, considered as a possibility, is that even in cases of incest or abject abuse, husbands and wives were not qualified to be divorced, to be fully divorced. The best hope for a woman like Eunice was to apply for a legal separation, but this would not completely free her from her husband, and she would be unable to marry again. So she's just basically stuck with him for life. Now, technically, Eunice might have qualified for a, a divorce under the existing laws, since she had testimonies from eyewitnesses, one man, for instance, who had seen her husband um, in a back room bed with a woman who was not his wife. She herself said, actually, that she had ocular, uh, uh, ocular proof of his infidelity, I'm not exactly sure what that is, in his own house. So, lawmakers would raise this question again, and again, why is this woman bothering us in the legislature when she could just sue for adultery in the court of chancery, get a divorce that way? The problem was that proof wasn't enough. In this era, divorce was considered a punishment for a crime. And what scholar Henry Hartog has called a guilty mind was required. But Eunice was hard pressed to present her husband as an incorrigible adulterer in need of punishment when he had willingly, voluntarily joined a celibate sect. You could say that he'd already punished himself. This is why in the winter of 1815, Eunice took her case to the capital to request a special act of relief that would grant her a divorce and custody rights as an exception to the existing laws. Lawmakers were sympathetic right from the start. Within months of repetition, they actually passed the first ever custody law, which finally made it possible for mothers like herself to apply for custody of her children. Now the problem, though, was that for Eunice, she doesn't know where her children are. She does not know that they're in Enfield, New Hampshire. She suspects they're with the Shakers, but she, doesn't, she can't prove anything. So how could she even begin to seek custody of the children when she didn't know where they were? So she was forced to go back to the legislature again. And this time, she took on not just her husband, but his people. Now, the Sheikhs had developed a pretty good reputation all day by this time. They were known as hardworking, honest neighbors who lived in clean, orderly communities, which means a lot at a time when you're throwing slops out the window and making all kinds of mess. They were excellent producers who sold the freshest produce in town, not to mention all sorts of ingeniously crafted combs and buckets and rooms and things like that. They were, in short, perfect embodiments of the Protestant work ethic. And they had friends and admirers in high places, including Attorney General Martin Van Buren, um, Buren, the future president of the United States. But the Shakers also remained vulnerable. These were uncertain times. Not just New Yorkers, but Americans at large were reeling from war and on the brink of financial panic, and that would strike in 1819. And strange things were happening. Snow in the summertime, terrible harvests, Prices so high that many went hungry, and debtors' jails were overflowing. It was easy to become anxious about a group of people who seemed unusually prosperous, well-fed, and just a little weird. How was it that they shaped their spirits so well while all others suffered? What if they were not, in fact, what they seemed? Were they really celibate, or were there something else going on? Is it possible that they had other designs, ambitions to take over the state and nation? These were the kinds of questions that Eunice Chapman set into motion one whisper at a time in early 1816. And by the spring, at least one group of legislators became so excited that they proposed to kill off the Shakers, legally that is. That spring, a committee of senators actually proposed legislation decreeing that all persons having families and who shall hereafter attach themselves to the society called Shakers shall be considered as civilly dead, that their estate shall be disposed of as though they were really dead, and rendering them forever thereafter incapable of taking any estate, real or personal, by inheritance. Now, even in proposal form, this was a huge victory for Eunice. Think about it. Eunice's fundamental quandary was that being a wife, she was considered civilly dead in the eyes of the law. She had no legal voice against her husband. 
Eunice achieved that, or hoped to achieve from this measure, was an exquisite reversal of roles, a true eye for an eye, if you will. In other words, if the legislature passed this act, which would, it would liberate Eunice from her marital bonds and proclaim the Shakers simply dead, it would now be James and the Shakers who would be dead to the world, while Eunice herself would be civilly reborn. Now, this proposed legislation, as you can imagine, would generate an enormous controversy in the coming years. How could it not when you're killing citizens off? Thomas Jefferson himself would weigh in on the matter, declaring that it threatened to, quote, carry us back to the times of the darkest bigotry and barbarism to find a parallel, unquote. But that would be not for more than a year later. Astoundingly, there was not, there was no newspaper coverage of the proposed act when it was first introduced, not even in Albany, and there would be no coverage of Eunice Chapman's case until the following year, in March of 1817, when there was a small but significant shift on the first page of the Albany Gazette and Daily Advertiser. A change would have large consequences for Eunice. In that month, the name William Lee Stone first appeared on the masthead. From Stone's pen, we get for the first time a riveting and intimate view of what lawmakers were saying about a case that became much more than about one woman's troubles. This is a case that refracted essential questions facing the United nation. Questions about marriage, religious freedom, civil rights, sexuality, and women's roles. Should the Shakers be punished for allegedly harboring the Chapman children and for breaking up families? Or would such act action constitute an infringement on their religious and civil liberties? Was Eunice Chapman so wronged as a wife that she deserved to be divorced? Or would freeing her from her marital obligation to cheapen the institution of matrimony? What was marriage all about? At what point did the government need to intervene in the family's affairs, in the affairs of a religious order? Which would the legislature overstep its bounds by depriving James Chapman and the Shakers of their marital and custodial rights? Or was such a move necessary to protect innocent women and children? And finally, which was worse? The sexless Shakers, who indoctrinated impressionable youngsters with their unnatural views, or Eunice Chapman, whose real motives have alleged was not to be reunited with her family, but to remarry and have her sexual life restored. These are just a few of the questions that work their way through Stone's remarkable reports, which remain highly relevant today. In a blog post um, for the New York Public, New York Times editor Barry Gewen recently invoked Henry Miggs's commentary on Eunice Chapman's case to discuss the mosque building controversy in New York. Here are Miggs's words. Now, I had actors during this through lens, so I'll have to bear with me as I try to channel some of these characters. The Constitution of the state guarantees equally the religion of all. The Jew, who believes the blessed Savior an imposter, the Egyptian, who worships a crocodile or an onion, the pagan, who worships the sun, the Indian, who pays divine honors to sticks and stones, the worshippers of Odin, the Chinese, or the Mahometans, all persuasions, denominations, or religions are equally protected. As Ewan observes, it's hard to see how Henry Mix isn't relevant today. Now, what's so wonderful about these reports of Stone, as you can tell from what I've just read, is that they don't just simply recall the speaker's points. They capture all the colorful oratory, the exclamations, the analogies, the rich language that brought spectators to their feet. We'd have absolutely none of this if it weren't for Stone. To illustrate this point, let me just read you what we'd have instead. Lines from the legislative journals, which go like this. The House then resolved itself into a committee of the whole on the engrossed bill from the Honorable of the Senate entitled An Act for the Relief of Eunice Chapman and for other purposes together with the objections of the Honorable of the Council of Revision thereto. The debates were had thereon and determined in the affirmative. <laughs> debates were had thereon in the passive voice, no less. Here, in contrast, is just one fragment of those fantastic debates which Stone provides in his paper. These are the words of Nathan Williams in the assembly. Sirs, this Eunice Chapman is not one of those modest, retiring, deserving women for whom we should entertain a sympathy. She has been boldly courting public opinion for years instead of concealing her griefs, if she has any. No modest woman would 
conduct herself thus. No modest and virtuous woman would be harassing the legislature year after year and barely and avowedly for the purpose of obtaining the liberty of marrying another man. Such a female can be only and only be an object of disgust, if nothing else, for her impudence. By passing this bill, we shall give boldness to the female character. Those who are now apparently amiable, encouraged by the success of Eunice Chapman, would become emboldened. The vermil tinctured hues which modesty casts upon the cheek at the least indelicate expressions or action would be chased away. They, like Eunice Chapman, would leave their retirement and by familiarity with gentlemen would soon become emboldened and would be haunting the members for divorces. If not for Stone, we just have to satisfy ourselves with the debates we have thereon. <laughs> now why did Eunice Chapman's case blow up so large? How was it that she got legislators to pay attention to her year after year? and ultimately when unprecedented rights, when no one else had such luck. I mean, this is like centuries of people applying for divorces, and really with miserable circumstances. Why Eunice, and not your Laurel Hall, for instance, or Mary Pardee, or any of the other women whose names appear and then disappear in legislative journals? Legislators themselves repeatedly ask this question, why this woman? Why, why are we bothering with her? And here's a second place where William Lee Stone provides the answer. Now, Stone's personal insights are not too helpful in the matter. Stone personally attributes Eunice's successes to some strange infatuation, some magic, some invisible influence in the legislature, essentially a kind of witchery. She calls her a modern enchantress. But we have, thanks to Stone, a record of the speech delivered on April 1817, uh, in April 1817, which does indeed solve the mystery. This is a speech delivered by the veteran assemblyman Nathaniel Pendleton, who was famed, among other things, for having held the, um, the dying Alexander Hamilton in his arms um, after the founding father was shot in his duel with Aaron Burr. According to Stone, Pendleton, this is an extended quote, mentioned other cases in this session for, of applications for divorces, some of which were much stronger than this. And this, he said, would have shared the same fate had it not been for the artful pamphlet of Mrs. Chapman. From this one line, we learn that the Shaker, what the Shakers then confirm, which is that Eunice's legislative fortunes were utterly transformed by her tell-all literature. As we might expect, the American Antiquarian Society has copies of these rare works. An account of the conduct of the Shakers, and number two, an additional account. Now these books were hardly literary gems, but politically speaking, they were brilliant. Here Eunice portrays herself as a consummate sentimental heroine, a real life damsel in distress, whose family has been destroyed by the evil shakers and who is in desperate need of saving. Well before Harry Beecher Stowe would do so with such resounding success, Eunice uses the strategies of literary sentimentalism to expert political effect, pulling her readers into the narrative working them up into a tearful lather and making them yearn for some kind of release or outlet, which she then conveniently provides. Weep, weep, she exhorts her readers at one point, and then when the story has reached its emotional kind of climax and just can't take it anymore, she commands, act, do something with all your feelings, do something to fight the shakers. Now that you've heard my story, you are responsible for bringing it to a close. The story isn't over yet. Help me write a happy ending, or risk becoming like the Shakers yourself, brutal, immovable, and cold. Now, Eunice papered Albany with these sensational writings, leaving a book on the desk of every single member of the legislature, and selling more copies to the ladies. Her words had an instantaneous effect. The Shakers recall entering the city and suddenly being harassed on all sides, and these are people who were welcomed before for, for their beautiful and, and uh, tasty wares. Uh, tasty vegetables and, and beautiful wares. Brothers could barely show their faces in town due to all the abuse, and even young children would just scream insults as they would pass by. It was as the Shakers had been transformed overnight into demons, at least in the public eye, while Eunice herself emerged as a pure and stainless soul, a paragon of virtue, or as one impassioned legislator, legislator called her, an ornament to her sex. Yet Eunice was a much more complicated person than what it's appeared.
appears in her published writing. And this is a third way in which William Wheatstone proves helpful. He introduces us to the senior side of her character, with, might I add, a good deal of glee. There was bad blood between Stone and Eunice, and I'm not entirely sure why it became so ugly. When Stone first began covering Eunice's case, he seemed to have been as charmed by her as everyone else, calling her a fair and fascinating petitioner. But there were a lot of pressing issues in the legislature at this time. The future of slavery in New York State, for one, the fate of the Erie Canal, which was far from assured at this time. And from the beginning, Stone made it clear that he thought that this woman was just taking up too much valuable time. The lawmakers should be thinking about more important matters. And it's possible that his impatience just simply festered into disdain. But I think there might have been something more, perhaps even personal, because his attacks on her became really vicious. At the time of the great debates on her case, Stone came to see it as his, as his mission to expose what he considered to be Eunice Chapman's true nature. At one point, he actually devoted a two-page spread to character assassination, and it was chock full of zingers such as the following. Eunice Chapman may be chased for all we know, but to turn a figure of Sir William Draper's round, a woman's honor must be like a soldier's, not only pure, but unsuspected. Yet Stone did the worst damage not by launching such attacks, but by reprinting some of the damning words that were penned in Eunice's own hand. Thanks to the Shakers, Stone had copies of letters that Eunice wrote to the heads of Shaker society, letters that she surely did not intend to be made public. And he reprinted these letters, which reveal a persona that could not be more different from the tortured heroines of Eunice's published words. I'll read you an excerpt of one letter, which Eunice wrote to Mother Lucy Wright, the head of the Shakers, and she calls her Mrs. Lucy Goodrich, you'll see. Um, Lucy Goodrich was her married name. Mrs. Lucy Goodrich, I now call upon you to take the matter into serious consideration and judge whether you would not better hastily restore my children and grant me some compensation for all my trouble on your account, on account of your society's abuse of me and my children, and thereby to prevent your complete overthrow. You know on what a foundation you stand. The sword of justice is lifted against you, and you cannot sheathe it unless you comply. Remember that a woman can be as mighty to pull you down as a woman was to build you up. If you think it is for revenge, remember that a woman can die deep in that art, even to exceed an army. Pretty powerful stuff. Now that she's addressing another woman rather than a male public, Eunice exults in the powers um, and her powers, it sounds downright unwomanly with all that talk of revenge and swords, especially in contrast to the dignified Mother Lucy, whose letter Stone also reprints. Stone goes so far as to question Eunice's credentials as a Christian, demanding, can a mind that broods with delight, that thus feasts in anticipation of that cursed passing revenge, be well disposed toward a God who has commanded us to love our enemies? Nay, tell us whether a Christian would thus piously prostitute, thus impiously prostitute the name of the Almighty. The effect these letters had on the public was absolutely terrible. Eunice knew better than anyone else the woman's reputation as she was her only dependence for her existence. The Shakers report, uh, sorry, the um, Stone's report um, and his uh, letters brought Eunice complete shame in, in town. She was absolutely mortified. And the Shakers report on her actually trying to get Stone to publish another view of her characters, alternate testimonials, but to no avail. Stone categorically refused. Fortunately for Eunice, the worst of these attacks came after her legislative victory, overcoming intense opposition from not just Stone, but many others. And after more than three years of hard lobbying, Eunice Chapman, as we know, made history, winning unprecedented rights to custody and the only legislative divorce ever passed in New York history. And thanks to Stone, we get a picture of that triumph. 
Votes were called in the assembly, and in a landslide, 85 to 27, the House rallied to make the act for the relief of Eunice Chapman law. Now, Eunice, we learned from both Stone and the Shakers, did not behave in her most ladylike manner. I suspect that she'd just been holding things in for so long that she just, when she did this moment of triumph, she just exploded. And in fact, she became so brazen by their reports that some lawmakers actually wanted to change their votes, but it was too late. But Eunice was not the only one whose behavior was out of line in this moment. Stone himself cried out, Oh, tempora, oh, mores, or what times, what customs, a line from Cicero that bemoaned society's moral decline. Stone would pay dearly for his partisan declaration, losing his seat in the House. And the war of words between Eunice and Stone just became unbelievable. This was when Stone launched his bitterest attacks against Eunice. And Eunice actually retaliated. When he wouldn't print um, alternate testimonials in his paper, she figured, well, I'll just print up, print up another copy of my book, and I will, I will avenge myself here. And um, here she, uh, towards the end of her book, she refers to some Judaic editors hired by the Shakers and their man to publicly insult the endearing affection of a bereaved mother. And she portends a terrible end for Stone in a mean little note of any at the end of the book. She writes, the editor of the Daily Advertiser, W. L. Stone, in his several different papers since the 14th instant, has frequently complained of ill health, indisposition, and inability to attend to business. His disease appears to be truly alarming, which we think must prove mortal unless his physicians are able to procure for him now and then a restorative. And for some reason, she writes in big capital letters, a bone to pick with three exclamation points. I'm not really sure what that means. Uh, but I think it just emphasizes how um, uh, vindictive she was in this moment. But in the end, neither Eunice nor Stone met the doom the other predicted or wished upon the other. Stone overcame his mysterious illness, and within two months of Eunice's legislative victory, he resigned as the editor of the Albany Gazette, moving on to edit other newspapers and debunk the uh, fictions of other silly profligate women, such as Maria Monk. As for Eunice, Albany was merely a pit stop for her as well. Her singular goal was to recapture her children, and her victory in the legislature, while it was an important part of the process, did not signify the end. Indeed, at the time of her victory, she was still not sure where her children were. The final battle would occur many miles away, several months later, in a Shaker village in New Hampshire. This was one strange night in May, when there was snow on the ground, and our angry mother, leading a mob, threatened to take the Shakers by storm. I'd like to leave you with some final words from the woman who led the way, words that we owe to William Lee Stone. And this is her letter to the Shakers after she got her law passed or before she had her children. <clears throat> I have thought I would not warn you again of my intention, but it is revealed to me that I must warn you as Moses did the Egyptians, that for your stubbornness your overthrow may be the greater. Think not that the battle is over after such a victory is gained. I'm collecting my forces for a new invasion. You see what I, as an instrument in the hands of God, have brought to pass. You see that all of your money, nor your lawyers, or your gods could not save you. You have fallen before a poor, weak woman. I shall convince you that my children is object, my object, and my children I will have. I have told you before that if you will restore to me my children, I will be at peace with you. I do not wish to spend the best of my days in contending with you. You see that the more you oppose me, the more you expose yourselves. I have looked to God for direction and still look to God. He has crowned me with success and blessed be his name. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, who will be speaking here in a few weeks, came up with a line that I see on bumper stickers everywhere. Well-behaved women seldom make history. Well, Eunice Chapman showed what one outspoken, unruly woman could do. I thank everyone here at the American Antiquarian Society for helping me to bring her story alive.